incredible. But right now, I gotta I gotta welcome in a Packers legend and uh, a somewhat completely disassociated uh, colleague, somewhat three times removed. If you talk about the Packers Radio Network, we got John Coon in the house, ladies and gentlemen. John Coon joining us here on Cheesehead TV. John, what's up, buddy? Oh no, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. There it is. Unmute. What's up, Negor? Happy draft day to you. There he is. How are you, sir? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Super excited. Super pumped. Uh, ready for this first round to uh, to start really getting rolling here, so we can find out who's going to be right. helping out Jordan Love this year. I mean, that's what it's about, right? Especially, it's funny you say that because it's all this kind of talk about like the Aaron Rodgers thing has taken up so much oxygen right throughout kind of the last month and then you look at okay but the Packers have to put a team on the field next year Jordan Love is going to be under center like who's going to be playing with him Uh, we've got obviously a pretty promising class from last year what do you think at 13 do you think it's you have to help your quarterback or do you think Brian stays true to the board and possibly edges in play or where do you see it going you know, um, they're really at an interesting spot at 13. I've talked about this a lot the last couple of weeks. When you talk about you can draft best available, I, I mean, you look at the Packers roster right now, um, where they're at with the uh, the position groups on offense, especially the skill positions. I, I would not be surprised if any one of those positions are addressed early on. Um, you have some spots on the defensive side at edge, safety, at, uh, interior defensive linemen that – um, obviously need to be addressed. And yet, if you took a position like a, a lockdown corner or an offensive tackle for the future, you could validate that as well. So I really think at 13, you could you could do anything. You could really go off the board. But as we know, Brian Gutekunst, he likes to make moves in drafts. He likes to get the guys that he targets. Yes. And uh, at 13, that really puts you in a spot where you can really figure out who you think is the best player let's say a JSN, if you really think he's the best wide receiver in this draft, which a lot of people do, he might not be around at 13, but you might be able to sneak up to a nine or a 10 in order to get him. So there's so many different ways, so many different directions that this thing can go. And it's so, it's so variable and unpredictable, even more so than, than any other year with this draft that I just, I, I, you know, you could flip a coin and try and guess what Brian Gutekunst is going to do. (laughs) <laughs> right. Let me ask you this, because obviously you've played the game right at the highest level and you've played uh, in a particular style of offense. I keep hearing this kind of bandied about this year, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Because Aaron was so heavily invested and involved when it came to what they wanted to do on offense. And now obviously he's been traded. He's in New York. We're going to finally see the Matt LaFleur offense. I keep hearing that. And I don't know how true that is. Do do you think that that's like, because to me, Matt has said repeatedly, you know, both before, you know, when Aaron was here, but even now at the owners meetings, what have you, it is a collaborative process. I don't know that what that means. Do you think it's going to be markedly different or do you think it's somewhat similar with maybe, you know, tweaks here and there? Well, okay, so there's there's two, you know, there's two facets to a Matt LaFleur offense. It's it's the game planning side of it. It's it's how he game plans for other teams, and it's the play calling side of it. Um he talked in the past very heavily about how the game plan was not just he, it was he and Aaron Rodgers. They they, they worked on these things together, hand in hand, and and how they were gonna prepare for these teams, how they were gonna um try and attack defenses. Also have and Pete that's not Audrey? You know, that's not independent of the Green Bay Packers. That's what good teams do with good quarterbacks. They let their quarterbacks have input. Um, Then you talk about on the field when the play gets called. We know Aaron Rodgers, and this was a big deal at the beginning, 2019-2020 of the Matt LaFleur era. Aaron Rodgers had the ability to audible, throw looks, throw keys, change things all around when you get onto the field. A Matt LaFleur, when you talk about what his offense should be, the tree that he comes from is a Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan type tree. That tree um, takes a lot of, not not all of it, but it takes a lot of the decision-making 
away from the quarterback. It simplifies things. It makes it easier right. choices for the quarterback. It's a lot more. It's a lot more hands on for a coach when they game plan. They have keys and looks and reads built into the plays so that the the play should always have the right answer. And it's just based upon um, the few keys that Matt Lafleur tells the quarterback to key on. With that being said. Matt LaFleur will also call a couple plays. So he'll call plays that can be canned and switch to different plays. And again, that's that's off of what Matt LaFleur tells the quarterback to do. So I think we're going to see, when you say how much of this is going to be Matt LaFleur, I think it's gonna, the, the offense is still going to be similar. We're still going to have crossing routes all over the place. Outside zone is still going to be <laughs> a big part of the scheme, especially with Jordan Love's mobility right. to be able to get on the run, get on the move. You're going to want to do that uh, more so than you did with Aaron Rodgers. But – you're just going to see more of it. It, it. It's going to be what we've seen in the past, but more. So I, I would say, yeah, you you are going to get more of a sense of what Matt LaFleur does as a game planner, a creator of the script. And then you're going to be able to see Matt LaFleur true play calling style come to form. Is this the kind of offense you would have liked to play in? I mean, I, I know like when you play with Mike and the guys there in Green Bay, you were very, it was much more West Coast centric. Is this something that you would have enjoyed? Yeah. You know, it, it, this is the one thing I found out. I played, I played in three different styles of offenses. In, in Pittsburgh, it was smash mouth counter. It was downhill run. It was right. power. Um, <laughs> it, it was BIM. It was, it was all kinds of things like that with deep play action That's shots and, uh, and quick three-step drops for the pass game the two years that I was there. And then I came and I was in a pure West Coast offense. That thing got morphed more into a West Coast <laughs> quarterback make the decision offense make the decision right. on the field there was a time when you know when when our offense was primarily no huddle and we would run no huddle plays we would call the plays on the field based off of how the defense lined up um and then when i got down there with sean payton man that thing the whole run game was based off of duo it was more downhill but that offense that that it went in many different angles and webs and directions. So there was no true, like one thing you could hang your hat on in, in a Sean Payton offense. I say all of that. Um, I had fun in all of them. I, I enjoyed all of them for a bunch of different reasons. Obviously there's, there's something to be said about a fullback and a power run game. Like we had in Pittsburgh. That was a lot of fun because you're a lot of hands-on stuff there, but the West coast, especially my first few years in, in green Bay, the West Coast was truly great for me because I loved blocking and I also loved getting out into the flat, catching a screen, catching a ball, doing oh, a little yeah. belly here or there. So there's a lot of different things in the West Coast offense that fit my game uh, really well. But Malaflor's offense uses a fullback too. I think it would be fun. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this before. I'm sure you're going to hear this for the rest of your life, but I'll always appreciate the job you did on the play in Chicago when you come across formation to pick up Julius Peppers, allowing Aaron to hit Randall Cobb for the big touchdown. Do you get like, does that play get mentioned to you like pretty much every day of your life? Cause I, I'm serious. Like I just see your name or hear your name. And that's the first play I think of. Yeah. And it's, it's probably the, the play I'm most associated with, especially with fans as well. It was a very important play uh, for that season. It was a very a, a, a symbolic play for that season because that was the season Aaron Rodgers broke his collarbone. Randall Cobb right. um, had the leg injury in Baltimore. We missed both those guys for about two months of the season, and then they came back for that Chicago game. And us being able to get over the hump in that Chicago game and uh, and win that it, it it was a big play. It was a big moment. It was a big game in in my career, probably even in in Aaron's career and Randall's career. Um, but it's funny you mentioned Matt Lafleur's offense. Because that play was only possible because it allowed the offensive line to make adjustments on the field. It allowed the quarterback to make adjustments on the field. It allowed myself, um, the, the blocking back on the play, to make adjustments on the field. It allowed the wide receivers like Randall Cobb to adjust his route on the play during the play. Malafloor's offense has some elements of that built into it. Um, but I don't think I'd have been doing the scan that I did had I been in Matt LaFleur's offense. I would have had my nose in an A-gap trying to pick up whoever right. was left in the A-gap at that point in time. I love it. John, I, I can't thank you enough for hanging out and stopping by and chatting with us even just for a little bit. I know it's it's draft night. Everyone's really busy. I really appreciate the time, man. 
Who do you think they're going to take? Let me let me uh, let me interview you a little bit now. At thirteen, who oh, do okay. you think they're going to take? I think they're going to take like Van Ness, the the edge player from Iowa. That's like that's what I think they're going to do, right? I really want them to take Darnell Wright, the tackle out of uh, Tennessee. I think either one of those are probably in the mold of what they would do. I'm going to – you'll be able to knock me over with a feather if if they take JSN. Like, I know that's what Packers fans want to have happen. Like, that has been all up in my Twitter feed all month, really. I just don't see it. I just – I think, you know, you talk about the Packers and the way they operate and the way they invest long-term in premium positions. I think they're going to want an edge or a tackle, and I think they're going to both be on offer at that pick. And I just don't – like, as talented as JSN is, and he is, like, you can get Mingo later – you can get any number of guys later that are going to be really good in this offense and really good complementary pieces to what you've got cooking with Watson already and Dobbs and what have you. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I And I know there's been a lot of talk about a tight end there. I can't imagine they'd take a tight end at 13, but I didn't think they would take an off-ball linebacker last year. So and that's what you said. Like, flip a coin, man. There's so many possibilities. None of it would really surprise me too much. There really are so many possibilities. I, I, I'll tell you this, though, speaking with the people that um, I know that evaluate and that grade and, and kind of set boards, this draft is a, it's a really unique draft. There's, there's only about 15 to 20 guys that have first round grades on them anyway. So the whole Heard notion that, that, yeah. that Brian could trade back, could trade back up into the end of the first round really puts that into question what would he would he trade back into the first round if if guys don't actually have first round grades would he would he keep draft capital because they look at the draft is you know capital each position is assigned a value of points and and they're trying to get those players that are worth those points it's like you're going to the shopping market and you're trying to take your points and buy something that's worth more points mm. with the points that you have right and uh and and, and i see that happening with brian um, I will say yeah, about JSN, and, and everybody's everybody's excited about it. I don't know if he'll be around at 13. He is the consensus best wide receiver yeah. in a draft that is not near as deep as other wide receiver drafts that we've seen in recent history, not near as deep as next year's wide receiver draft. So I don't think he'll be there at 13, but if he is and we're still picking at 13, man, that would be a hard one to pass up because you're talking about you'd have right. three – pass catchers for Jordan Love to spend multiple seasons with. That would be something to be exciting about. I'm all in on this idea. And plus it would help my Madden game, which is really the most important thing. <laughs> I mean, if we're really being honest. What do you, so. When do you get on the sticks? Oh, dude, come on now. Almost every night. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm really? a total Madden junkie. It's terrible. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's like, it's oh, a disease. Like I can't not play. I have to play at least once a day. It's awful. It, it's awful. And it's always somebody online and I can hold my own, but inevitably there's like some 12 year old who knows like every button and every like zone blitz and like gets me bad. And then I get like rage quit and it's awful. But for the most part, I'm, I can hold my own. Do, do you like the new Madden games? I, I know the, the graphics and everything are cool, but I, I don't know. There was something about the old Madden. They're not as good. There's not as good, man. There's not as good. Plays and you could just run those three or four plays. Yeah. And grind it. Two K one was where like the two K one was like the peak of of football like video game. Like two K one, two K and two K one on the Sega Dreamcast. That was the peak. And since then, and everyone's been coasting. You know, EA got the license, and then they just don't have to innovate and blah blah blah. So. But that's what I mean. Like, if I if I get JSN on my squad, I'm going to kill some people. It's going to be great. Because I'm already, like, I've been playing with Jordan Love for, like, a month now. And I, I'm just, you know, you just run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. And then you hit him with a deep shot to Watson. People aren't used to that. They're just not ready for it. It's great. It's awesome. I love it. I love it. My next question for you, Negs. When do the Packers draft a quarterback? Uh, yes, I think day two. I don't think – I know that – I've seen really? some people say in day three – I think I would not be surprised, especially because they've got that extra pick from the Jets. And I don't think it's especially in the second round, but the third round, how awful have they been in the third round? Like, it's been bad. Like, we don't have to sugarcoat it. Like, the third round has been, it's been a rough stretch. A, a cursed almost. It's been a rough stretch. So why not get a, get a quarterback? Find a QB that you can develop. And, hey, 
you know, you've been throwing away picks for a decade, essentially. I mean, well, who was the last third round pick that hit in Green Bay? It's been a long time. So let's get a quarterback and develop him a little bit rather than throwing away a guy out of skill position or whatever. And if you use a third that's round my, pick that's on a guess. quarterback, then he doesn't have to be graded. You don't have to get graded on a third round pick because he's just going to be the backup. That's what I'm player. saying, because he's not going to play. And like, you know, <laughs> and here, look. You know, you you know when Aaron took over, they took uh, Brom in the second and Flynn in the seventh. You know, I, they gotta they gotta. I think they gotta invest in the position. I mean, shout out Danny Etling, but you know, you got you gotta get you gotta get some quarterbacks in the building, and you don't want to spend free agency. It'll dollars. be interesting. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. I love it. They don't have free agency dollars to spend, but they definitely need more arms at camp. So quarterbacks are coming, but how early? That's the yep. question. Yeah, we'll see. Day two or day three, but they're definitely coming. John, can't thank you enough, buddy. Have a great night. Hey, Thanks for hanging out with Packers eggs, fans worldwide. Eggs, eggs before John goes. Before John goes. We oh, we got a question in the gallery. No, well, it's. Well, three, what do we got? Two, one.